During World War II, the Allies' open secrets policy meant that the Americans got to see the jet engine. If the jet engine had been lacking in character, then it was about to get it in spades. This is the Pratt & Whitney J57, the engine that took the world into the jet age. This one jet could develop thrust equivalent to 15 Spitfire engines. Up, up forward here is we have the inlet. That's where all your air enters the engine. Okay, as it comes through this section, it's got a compressor section, and it's taking the air and compressing it down. And when it comes into this portion, it's diverting it into the burner section. This is the burner section. And all around here, you got cans that got flame in them. Right. The flame is contained, and it comes down here, and it hits into the turbine section. These right. are turbine wheels in here, which help assist the right. compressor turn. Because there's one when, shaft, so the turbine, one, the turbine accelerating shaft. makes the compressor go faster, which yes, makes it's the turbine just go an, faster. It, it just yeah. help to do that. Basically, the Americans took Whittle's jet and added sex. The F-100 Super Sabre, or the Hun as it was warmly known, was introduced to the US Air Force in 1950 fitted with a J-57. On its first flight, the pilot took it up to 35,000 feet, opened the throttle, and smashed through the sound barrier, the first plane ever to go supersonic in level flight. And it was thanks to a feature that was to inspire schoolboys the world over. Did you used to do drawings like this at school? Go on, own up. One of the salient features of these drawings was always a big flame coming out the back of the aeroplane. Which brings us, conveniently, to one of the more snazzy developments of the jet engine. Now, those of you being paying attention will remember that we have our combustion here, which burns and squishes out the back, driving our turbine, which, along this shaft, drives our compressor, sucking in more air, then we can burn more fuel, through the turbine faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. It got so good that the old compressor was producing so much oxygen that some of it would come squishing out the back end. Now, some boffin noticed this and thought, hello, and decided to start squirting fuel in. This is where the afterburner started. There were little nozzles all the way down the back end here, which squirted extra fuel in at the back end here, a little igniter here, and effectively, it worked like a rocket. It just came flying out the back like that, and produced tons and tons of thrust. The afterburner summed up America's attitude to the jet engine. Pure raw power at any expense. It was like saying, we've got so much fuel, we can do whatever we like with it. But who cared? At a moment's notice, it would add up to 50% more power. The producer who in any other walk of life would be locked up. Thinks it might be quite funny to stick some marshmallows in the tail of this afterburn. And uh, guess who got the job? The method is this. Take the engine up to full power, flick the switch marked AB, and your fuel tank empties into the jet pipe. Bye bye, Johnny Mick. The J-57, with its afterburner, ensured America's aerial dominance in the 50s and soon became the ultimate power unit for peacekeeping in the West. Things must have looked pretty rosy for the United States. However, there was a small detail that had gone awry. When the British government had sent the jet to the Americans, they also sent a few to the Russians, so there wouldn't be any fighting, so to speak. Oh, dear. The jet engine was fundamental to the Cold War. It powered everything from the colossal B-52s to their fighter support to the refueling planes that kept them aloft for 24 hours at a time. In Vietnam, it allowed the bombers to operate from such a range and height that the planes were not visible or audible from the ground. It was so fundamental that the only way to keep the peace was by grounding them, chopping them up and recycling them.
This is the American Military Aircraft Recycling Center, where the jets get turned into dog food cans. It's an inglorious end for these mighty planes that once dominated the skies, but tough. It's a real dependable engine. I watched them on the B-52s and on the F-100s and the 86s and, uh, and the old thuds in Vietnam when I was there. But this is where the old airplanes all come to die. The scrapyard marked the beginning of the strategic arms limitation agreements between America and Russia. Planes have to be laid out in rows so they can be counted by Russian satellites before being decommissioned and dismantled. The mighty B-52, this particular one was a an Alcom carrier, which means it carried air-launched cruise missiles. And of course, uh, they were powered by these dependable J-57 engines, that uh, most reliable engine that... Uh, Everyone who's, who's flown with them seems very fond of that engine. Is it? Well, uh, it was very... Uh, That's fond isn't the word, but well, yeah, maybe it is. I it see. was a very, very reliable engine. So does it sadden you to see the end of all these planes? Or, oh, or do you, do you oh there's no doubt about it. Yeah. Here you had a very, very highly capable airplane that all of a sudden is uh, being scrapped out. Uh, uh -huh. You know, and but in a sense, I mean, it's, it's, it's... The speed and power of the jet engine totally changed the way wars were fought and meant that B-52s and their fighter escorts could leave Washington and be back in time for cheers. Even the cruise missiles they carried were powered by jets. So I think we can conclude that the jet engine is a good thing when you're going to Marbella to get pissed for a fortnight and a bad thing when it's carrying bombs to be dropped on people. Matter of fact, it's much the same thing, isn't it, if you're Spanish? But the jet's greatest impact was yet to come in commercial travel. And it was here that arguably the jet's most invisible but greatest asset came to the fore, reliability, which is possibly the most important thing you can ask from an aeroplane engine. It always kind of irritates me when people bitch on about how bad airline food is, as if sitting eating at 35,000 feet in a tin can wasn't a bit of a miracle in itself. And I think one of the ways people reassure themselves about flying and the fact that it is sort of unnatural is not to think about it and not to think about the fact that it's a machine and not to think about the fact that originally it was iron ore and bits of rubbish lying 20,000 feet under the ground. But today we're going to think about it a lot. Believe it or not, this is a jet workshop. It couldn't be further from the oily recesses of a garage. The atmosphere is more like an operating theatre. These are guys who take their work very seriously indeed. And when it comes to holiday time, you can be glad they do. It's precisely because the engine is so simple that a fault can be utterly catastrophic. It either works perfectly or not at all. So, this is a very delicate operation then, John. After the parts have already gone through visual inspection and analytical, where we measure the dimensions and seals, they come right. in here, and then we do this type of inspection for surface cracks only. Right. And I have a couple pieces here that I'd like to have you help me out and let's sure. wash them. And let's see how it goes then. See how it goes. Okay. I We're think good. these are made for a smaller man than me. Why does this all seem so familiar? <laughs> <laughs> so we shoot our Zyglo like this, and then we let it sit with the Zyglo on for 30 minutes. So we give it a pre-rinse. So cleanliness really is next to godliness in the machine there, shop, isn't it? And then to get off all the big stuff, we put it in our emulsifier, which gives it a uh, cleaner finish. OK, it's all washed off. Let's put it in the oven and let's see what it looks like. If you think this is all a bit over the top, think again. The component failure that brought down the Sioux City DC-10, one of America's worst air disasters, was traced back to a defect the size of a grain of sand. After the part is cooled for five minutes, then we put it in oh. underneath the black light. Right. And as you can see, this yes. piece has a couple cracks in it. This process sums up the jet engine's problem. It appeals more to the engineer than the mechanic. Unless you work here or get to fly one, you just don't get it. Of all the engines in the world, the jet engine is the one that seems to have the least kind of passionate following, really, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, compared you know, with to the... You know, to be honest with you, I, you know what I think it is? I think a lot of people cannot see the actual jet engine the working. Workings, yeah. They can't see like a prop jet. They can see propellers going, so they, yes. they feel safe. Yes. With a jet engine, you don't see that. 
All you know is that there's some kind of a noise. You take off, you land, and you're, you're safe. So perhaps the main problem for the jet is simply communication. As a passenger, you're never really going to feel the personality of the engine. The only time you really get to know it and love it is on the flight deck, which leaves only one option. I annoy you the way people take the jet engine so much for granted. <laughs> no, not at all. It's rather nice. Uh, it should be taken for granted. It's a yes. piece of machinery which is, has been proven over the years and flown well over 21,000 hours and had very few in-flight shutdowns in my whole flying career. Maybe the measure of a great engine is that you can't take it for granted. Because it isn't, a, it, it isn't an issue whether it's going to run or not. Engine fire number one engine. Oh my god. Take the bank off, Robbie. Robbie, take the bank off. Right wing down. Pull back, pull back. Whoa, we hit the runway. <laughs> James, gee, that was exciting. Foxtrot Kilo, we've arrived. With one wheel in the grass and the, the left wheel's on the runway. And those of you with cups of tea Foxtrot all over Kilo. your trousers, I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I wonder if they've got a simulated bar anywhere. Uh, we know this, Foxtrot Kilo. We are clearing one way now. <laughs> the jet engine is a true stroke of genius. It's absolutely everything you could want from an engine. Power, size, economy, reliability. And it's so simple. OK, it doesn't fall into the category of a Cadillac or a Gardner diesel as a slow tickover, but you can warm to that high-pitched whine. Next time you're sitting in an aluminum tube five miles above the ground, watching your favorite movie and complaining that the potatoes are a wee bit soggy, have a glance down the wing and look at one of these and ask yourself, what the hell's going on? Well, I mean, the whole plane's got to be clean, obviously. Ship shape in Bristol fashion, you might say. La, 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 la. It's very like my wife, actually. Doesn't it, dear? <laughs> <laughs> 